heartbreaking story as we get it. Police say an incident at Buckingham Palace is not being treated as terror-related. Armed officers detained a man in the early hours of yesterday morning after a car crashed into the gates. He was arrested on suspicion of criminal damage, then released on bail and has been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Pro-Palestinian protesters are being warned they could be lending credence to extremists. The community secretary is urging people to question which groups are organising these marches. Michael Gove, who's due to publish a new official definition of extremism, told the Sunday Telegraph there's no excuse for ignorance and that good-hearted demonstrators need to be aware they risk fueling hate and intimidation. London's Jewish community has braved rainy weather to demand the release of hostages being held in Gaza. They joined Jews around the world blowing shofars, traditional ram's horns, which are normally used at the holiest moments of the Jewish calendar. The last pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas was back in November when Hamas released more than 100 hostages. It's believed that the terrorist organisation still holds around 134 people kidnapped during the October 7 attack. A group of mothers are staging a hunger strike outside Parliament. A five-day protest aims to draw attention to parents who can't afford to eat and are therefore skipping meals to feed their kids. Their list of demands includes enforcing free school meals and universal credit to guarantee life's essentials. MPs are due to address the issue on Tuesday. The Princess of Wales has thanked the public for their support as the first photo of the royal was published after her abdominal surgery. The image posted on social media to mark Mother's Day was taken by the Prince of Wales in Windsor earlier on this week. Sitting down, Princess Catherine is surrounded by her children, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. She was admitted to hospital on January 16 and left two weeks later following a planned operation. She's expected to return to her royal duties after Easter. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now, back to Mr Oliver. Words matter. The precise meaning of words matters most of all. And one by one, those meanings are being changed right under our noses. Not only are we being censored, not only are legislators here in the UK and around the world turning the screws on the freedom to speak, words themselves are being stolen, made meaningless or gelded. For most of my life, the word woman referred only and precisely to an adult female human being, a human being born female with a female body. Not anymore. Now anyone can be a woman, can insist on being described and known as a woman, can co-opt the rights and status of a woman, make free with places set aside for the privacy and safety of women. All of it regardless and in denial of physical, biological reality. Racist is another word made slippery by modern meddling. All the way back in 1963, half a lifetime ago, Dr Martin Luther King Jr said he wanted a world in which each individual was judged not by skin colour but by the content of their character. A colour-blind world, if you will. Not anymore. Now it's a prerequisite to notice skin colour first and to judge character second, as often as not on the basis of that colour. Discrimination against white skin is not deemed racist, but is instead virtually a requirement of meeting the demands of equity, diversity and inclusivity. Equity, diversity, inclusivity, the stuff of word salads, along with other words and acronyms repeated by the powerful and meddlesome until it rendered into meaningless, mind-numbing cant. Save our NHS, flatten the curve, build back better, narrow window of opportunity, ESG, DEI. Extremist means whatever the establishment says it means, so that anyone and everyone might be labelled extremist if they hold and voice opinions at odds with the ideology of the day. Right and left, words that used to be descriptive of political affiliation, terms everyone understood, have not changed their meaning. Rather, they've been rendered utterly meaningless. A Nazi is anyone who disagrees with today's agenda. So too a fascist. 
Nazi, fascist and extremist are interchangeable, one-size-fits-all labels ready to be flung in the face of anyone deemed to be speaking out of turn. Diversity and inclusivity were once upon a time innocuous terms. Now they come laden with implied threat, empowering those that use them with authority that may not be challenged for fear of attracting the aforementioned labels of Nazi, fascist and extremist. One by one, words are being stolen from us or set aside for the exclusive use of those assuming authority over anyone they don't like, any dissenting voice. Even the word truth is all but gone. No longer absolute and inviolable, the straightforward truth. Now the truth belongs to the powerful and means whatever they say it means, and always with the flexibility to mean something else tomorrow and then the next day. Truth, what used to be meant by truth, truth for those who are otherwise powerless, is now misinformation or disinformation or, best of all, malinformation, which is truth that doesn't fit, that isn't wanted by the powerful, inconvenient truth. Anti-Semitic used to be descriptive of someone who, by speech or deed, made clear he or she did not like people of the Jewish faith. Now its meaning has been altered until it is descriptive as well of anyone opposed to actions of the State of Israel, even anyone with questions to ask about the legitimacy of those actions. Jewish people opposed to the actions of the State of Israel are also liable to be labelled anti-Semitic. In this way has anti-Semitism been devalued to the point where its ancient power to discourage racism is all but gone. The word democracy is little more than the punchline to a joke. In the United States, in this year of a presidential election, politicians have learned to say that democracy itself is on the ballot which is ironic, given that the intention is to have one name on the ballot and one name only. Other names banned, the name of Donald J. Trump removed altogether. The word democracy has had its meaning turned inside out, upside down. To be democratic now is to ensure the delivery of power into the hands of the few and to hell with the wants of the many. Last week in the UK, the PM, Rishi Sunak, Matt hurried back to London in the aftermath of a by-election in the English town of Rochdale. He stood at a podium outside number 10 and said the majority secured by George Galloway, leader of the Workers' Party and a legitimate candidate by any measure, was beyond alarming. He said change can only come through the peaceful, democratic process. Except we're left to infer when elections are won by candidates of which the establishment disapproves. In 2024, we are invited to accept that the settled will of the people must not trump the will of the establishment. On Thursday, in his State of the Union address, US President Joe Biden had a lot to say about democracy. In a pitch for more weapons and money for Ukraine, he invoked the memory of past presidents Roosevelt and Lincoln and the Civil War and said freedom and democracy were under attack at home and abroad. He said democracy must be defended, that the events of January the 6th added up to a dagger at the throat of US democracy. He called for respect for free and fair elections. All of that against the background of hundreds of billions of pounds and dollars of taxpayers' money already spent, I would say laundered, through Ukraine, not to mention half a million Ukrainian dead and counting. So much talk of democracy in the US and overseas while US puppet President Volodymyr Zelensky has silenced opposition in Ukraine, silenced the media, outlawed the orthodox faith. The war in Ukraine is surely a proxy war, prosecuted by NATO and the US, not in defence of democracy, but for political and financial gain, in naked pursuit of power and influence. The US and the West have been dabbling and meddling in Ukraine for years, for heaven knows how long, and for reasons yet to be made explicit, but long before any Russian tanks rolled across the border in 2022. This week, we learned that retiring US diplomat and warmonger Victoria Newland, architect of the coup that ousted the democratically elected president of Ukraine in 2014, setting in train murderous civil war, has had a street named after her in the country she did so much to devastate. So much for respect for free and fair elections. George Orwell, the author whose words are quoted now more than most, said political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. He said the purpose of politicians was the defence of the indefensible, 
which brings us to the word genocide, a word with more explosive power than any ordinance dropped in 1945. Apparently coined in 1944 by Polish-born US jurist Raphael Lemkin in specific reference to the Nazi extermination of the Jewish people, the word genocide literally means the killing of a tribe. Last month, the International Court of Justice deemed as plausible, plausible, accusations by the government of South Africa that the state of Israel was perpetrating a genocide upon the captive Palestinian people of Gaza. And yet, and yet, despite that statement by no lesser court than the International Court of Justice, still the use of the word genocide in the context of what is being inflicted upon the people of Gaza, well over 100,000 civilians dead, wounded, lost and counting, remains controversial to say the least. To misquote others of Orwell's words, all people are equal, but some people are more equal than others. Words matter. Famine is a word often misused and misapplied, or at least misunderstood. It comes from a Latin word that means to bring the hunger. Think about that, to bring the hunger. Famine is most precisely used now to describe an absence of food, an absence of food that might be interpreted as the will of God, perhaps, or an accident of nature caused by drought or by blighted crops. For some, it recalls thoughts of the suffering of millions of Ethiopians in the 1980s. Others hear the word and think of Ireland in the 1840s. In neither case were people starving to death for want of available food. Ethiopia was riven by brutal civil war and one side was withholding food from the other. Man made starvation as a weapon. In 19th century Ireland, the potato crop upon which the poor depended failed for years in a row on account of blight right enough. But there was food all around, meat and vegetables abounded, grown and raised in Irish fields, but instead of being given to the starving poor, it was loaded onto ships and exported. Man-made starvation once more. Back in Gaza right now, this moment, Gaza of the plausible genocide, people are starving to death, out of sight, but not out of mind. There is food nearby, some at least, but the humanitarian aid that might preserve life, make life possible, is being denied to the people of Gaza so that babies have no formula, nursing mothers have no water, children have no bread. President Biden talked this week about building a temporary pier for humanitarian aid deliveries. But what's the point, I ask, in delivering food for a few weeks of ceasefire while simultaneously unloading weapons in Israel for the moment the firing starts once more? All around the world, people are demanding an end to the war in Gaza. Millions march to call for a ceasefire at least and are labelled extremists. The marches described as hate marches. Hate's another word, possessed or manipulated by the powerful. It's apparently up to the powerful to decide and to define what is hate, what is hateful, who is hateful. Hate speech, stirring up hatred. These are new crimes for the age of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. New crimes for a time in which the truth is whatever the powerful say it is. Words matter. Here's the thing. If there is any truth at all in the notion that the pen is mightier than the sword, then words make the cutting edge of the blade. They are kept sharp by precise definition and use, but blunted into meaninglessness when redefined at the whim of the powerful, snatched out of the mouths of those who often have nothing more than words with which to make plain who they are and what they stand for. Words matter. Biden, so-called leader of the free world, calling for more war and the defence of democracy in a country where there is no democracy. One powerful word he did not utter once was Trump. Too powerful, perhaps. Biden said Putin is on the march, that Europe was at risk, that the whole world was at risk. One decrepit ghoul rousing a rabble of other ghouls. It was hard to watch, harder to listen to. Lies and more lies. The only words that matter now are those we hardly ever hear. The truth. Do you feel words are being taken from us, played with, tricked around? Neil, why I always relish coming on your show and listening to your monologues. Um, I mean, you know, they're a great uh, piece of wordsmithing, of course, in their own right. And as you said in your monologue, words matter. But facts matter even more, in my view. Um, we seem to have reached a point, haven't we, in our political discourse in this country, certainly in the United States and in others around the world, 
where what we're seeing is increasingly narrative and counter-narrative. I mean, you'll recall back in 2017, um, was it Kellyanne Conway, who at the time was the advisor to President Trump, she coined this term, alternative facts. Um, and it seems to me we've never quite recovered from that period, that what we've got is politicians of all tribes, of all stripes, who essentially engage in a battle for the public's attention by coming up with the facts that suit their narrative, rather than having an open, honest and frank, truthful debate with us about what's really going on. It's the words, though, for me, you know, mm. woman, racist, anti-Semitic, extremist. Not so very long ago, we all knew what those words meant. Yeah. But now they do seem to be, the definition seems to be in the hands of those that would use them against us. Well, as George Orwell said famously in 1984, this is an example of newspeak, which leads to doublethink. And doublethink is, a, uh, you know, the ability to hold two contradictory beliefs at the same time. And this is why I think for ordinary voters and citizens, they're so, they're so, they're so confused. You've put your finger on it. The ability to hold more than one idea in the head yeah. at the same time is the essence. Is the it essence. is. And we see this playing out in relation to gender criticism and all of that, absolutely. Much more from Tom to come. After the break, I'll be joined by the newly elected MP George Galloway for the first part of a no-holds-barred in-depth interview which will give us a more complete understanding of the man. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Don't go away. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right. We all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful. But what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse. That is the campaign. There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to our conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same you. reason, if You're you commit... You're obliged to use if you commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is... No, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel.
Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. Now, George Galloway has just begun work once more as a member of Parliament. I think it's either the seventh time or the eighth time. He brings 50 years of experience and he's already said that he wants to oust Labour's deputy leader from Parliament. He was sworn in as an MP following his by-election win in Rochdale last week. George joins me now. Lovely to see you, sir. And you. You could call me MP again after a brief <laughs> interlude of nine years. You just keep coming back and back, Mr Galloway. Mr Frank Sinatra. Fair, fair to say uh, you've put the wind up Westminster by your return. Yes, uh, and it's uh, a, a joy to behold not just Westminster, but their their coterie, their echo chamber in the legacy media, uh, ha have temporarily, one hopes, lost their minds. Uh, the Prime Minister erected uh, a, a, a lectern and a presumably big platform outside 10 Downing Street at the state's expense for an entirely party political uh, broadcast uh, to which there was no reply, not even at Prime Minister's questions where I failed to catch the speaker's eye. And I, I no longer opened the Google alerts of right-wing commentators, many of them on your very channel, uh, literally spewing hate speech at me, over me, about me. Uh, I'm not sure what I did to deserve it, but hey, it's a question of dogs barking and the caravan moving on. How do you feel about that reaction? You know, I said at the top that, you know, you're, uh, you're long in the tooth when it comes to being in Westminster, being in that febrile uh, environment. Uh, but after all of this time, with all of your experience, to be confronted with that kind of reaction, a prime minister saying that it was beyond alarming as a, a threat to democracy that, that a, a, a legitimate candidate had won a by-election. How? What was your gut reaction to that? Well, you know, I've often uh, been Daniel in the lion's den, dare to be a Daniel, uh, dare to stand alone. Uh, used to be one of my hero, Mr. Ben's favourite rhymes. Uh, and so I don't mind it. I'm only perplexed when it comes from unexpected quarters. Uh, as in GB News uh, uh, terms, it has. But the expected usual suspects, I, I relish their uh, angst. Um, I'm an experienced short sword fighter, as you said, for more than 50 years in politics. So, you know, I'm well able to handle it. The facts are chills that win a ding, as our bard said. Facts can't be changed. Uh, not only did I win a crushing victory over all three big parties of the state, but they didn't even come in second. Uh, a point which they all tried to um, erase. Uh, between me and a totally unknown independent, unknown outside Rochdale, uh, we got almost two-thirds of the votes, leaving the big three, big four parties of the state to share the other third. Uh, this is a crushing rejection of uh, the uni party, the two cheeks of the same backside who all got a big spanking uh, on uh, Thursday night past. What does it tell us about where we are now with politics in Britain, with democracy in Britain? As you say, the big two, the Conservatives and Labour, you know, beaten back by yourself and a previously a hitherto unknown independent. What is the nature of the powerless state of politics in this country? Well, uh, nobody loves them. Uh, that much could not be denied even by their mothers. Nobody loves Labour or the Conservatives, Sunak or Starmer, uh, quite possibly not even their mothers. And that's the first thing you have to chalk up as an uncontested fact. People still move for them, but only out of interest, not out of love. And when the public have a chance to vote for someone who can credibly defeat them, then they take that opportunity. 
And I think that uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back in Rochdale. Uh, the, uh, the spread of candidates, challengers, new parties, independent candidates, and so on, is now proceeding like wildfire. If I tell you that I have now in my pocket more than 300 prospective parliamentary candidates, all paying their own election expenses, by the way, because we can't pay them, more than 300 Workers' Party parliamentary candidates. Imagine that. Uh, we, we, we didn't have three four weeks ago. Now we've got more than 300. And then when you add in the independents that are popping up, growing like topsy across the country, uh, we are talking about a challenge to the legacy parties in practically every constituency in the land, certainly many hundreds of them. And thus, the uh, course of the next general election is radically altered. Uh, we'll either win seats or we'll stop Keir Starmer from winning them. Thus, the outcome of the general election is dramatically uh, uh, altered and all bets are off. So when I saw, for example, your own uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg of your parish making a tear-stained plea on GB News for people not to abandon the Labour Party, how much the country needs the Labour Party. I scratch my head in utter bewilderment, I must tell you. Bear with me, George. Tom Buick, do you scratch your head in bewilderment? What do you make of the, of the changes that are, in, that are indicated, that are evidenced by Mr Galloway's success in Rochdale and, as he says, the, the, the possibility now of an alternative to the, to the two cheeks of the same backside? Like a lot of ordinary voters, I'm scratching my head at just the degree of polarisation now that exists in our society. And, yes, you know, Labour and the Conservative Party need to take some responsibility for that kind of climate. But at the end of the day, we've also seen now elected to our mother of all parliaments politicians who, you know, depending on your point of view, I mean, George Galloway won the election, congratulations. Um, but to some people, he's a demagogue. And the definition of a demagogue is someone who appeals to prejudice rather than rational arguments. So my retort back to George Galloway is, in terms of his politics going forward, is he going to be a unifier or is he going to continue to be a divisive force in British politics? George, do you see yourself... What do you, or what is your reaction to, to being uh, uh, marked as a divisive figure in British politics? Well, I don't know who your guest is. I've never heard of him before, and I shan't stoop to answer his smear. I was elected in a democratic election with a thumping majority in which the two big parties of the state came third and fifth. So I don't have to answer to any unknown guest of yours. And I've got news for him. Politics was divisive from the moment that democracy existed. You decide to support this war or oppose this war. That's a division. Somebody has to speak for both sides of that division. I was kicked out of the Labour Party for being a leader of uh, the, war, the movement against the war on Iraq. Uh, no doubt your guest and others would have said my opposition to the Iraq war was divisive. But I turned out to be right. The people pushing for the war turned out to be wrong, now even by their own admission. And unfortunately, a million people lie dead and extremism cascading around the world as a result of my failure to persuade enough people to oppose that war. George Galloway, you know, I, George, Galloway, my... George Galloway, if you let me just interrupt there, I have to go to a break at the moment, but I think we can all see that George Galloway MP is back in the ring. Uh, after the break, I'll be continuing my discussion with George Galloway MP. Don't go away.
Hello there, welcome to your latest UB News weather forecast from the Met Office. We're well, looking ahead to the new working week. It's going to remain fairly changeable across the country, but increasingly mild. So as we end the weekend, we've still got this area of low pressure in charge. It will gradually move towards the continent as we go through into Monday. But before we get there, we've still got this area of rain uh, stretched right across the country. It will weaken as we go through the course of the night, and really it's going to leave behind quite a lot of mist, murk and cloudy weather. But under the cloud, it's not going to be a cold night by any means. Most of us stay in frost-free, coldest of the temperatures up across the very far north of Scotland. So for many, it's a bit of a grey, murky start out there on Monday morning. Some bits and pieces of light rain and drizzle around. And then during the course of the day, we will see a little bit more persistent rain just coming in across the very far west of Scotland and parts of Northern Ireland. Brightest of the weather will be down towards the southwest. So here in any brightness, we will see highs reaching around 11 or 12 degrees elsewhere. Temperatures a little bit up on Sunday, so feeling a little bit less cold. Into Tuesday, another band of rain works its way in from the southwest. The driest and the brightest weather reserved for the far north of Scotland throughout the day. Elsewhere, increasingly cloudy and wet as the day goes on. But it will drag in some milder air. So for everyone in the south, by the middle of the week, we'll see temperatures reaching the mid-teens, but staying wet in the north. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. Now, I'm lucky enough this week to have a double time with my guest, George Galloway, MP. So let's turn our attention to the situation in the Middle East conflict. Hello again, George. Now, you Hi. said that what happened in Rochdale, your attention on Rochdale was for Gaza. Can you tell me what you mean and meant by that? Well, the people who oppose the uh, murderous war in Gaza, which has reached the stage that the highest court in the world has said that it can plausibly be described as a genocide, pretty strong and heavy charge, which the highest court in the world has sent Israel for trial on, uh, is uh, so horrific to so many millions of people in this country and indeed around the world, uh, that it is a wonder that they are locked out of media and parliamentary opinion. Uh, no one speaks for the people out on the streets from Land's End to John O'Groats every other Saturday and midweeks and rain, hail, snow. Uh, nobody speaks for them in parliament. They don't get a look in. Uh, in the uh, the legacy media on the television, if they are interviewed, as you're interviewing me now, they're called uh, divisive or demagogic because they want to stop children being killed, slaughtered every day and night of the last 150 days. So there's something of a conspiracy against the voices for peace, for 
ceasefire, for withdrawal uh, from this war. And then a by-election came along. Uh, and what better place to fight, to break the silence, to break the mold, uh, than a parliamentary by-election, where, in the greater Manchester region alone, of which Rochdale is a part, there are the best part of a million and a half or two million people who oppose this war, based on my extrapolation from national opinion polling, attendance at protests, and so on. So it became a greater Manchester cause celebra, and people flooded in from all over the region. They worked uh, day and night, vast majority of them white English people, by the way, uh, who knocked on every door in the constituency, and the rest is history. We beat the uh, legacy political parties out the park. George, George, but for Gaza, but for events in Gaza, would you even have contemplated a return to Westminster? I probably would have in Rochdale. I knew the deceased member of parliament very well for 40 years. I knew the town of Rochdale very well, as I've been speaking in it regularly for 25 years. My daughter was born nearby. Two of my sons live nearby. And for my sins, I attend Old Trafford in Manchester every other week. So uh, I'm deeply uh, immersed in this part of the world. So I probably would. I, I probably wouldn't have if the by-election had been in I don't know, the home counties somewhere. But in Rochdale, in the Northwest, in Greater Manchester, where I already knew I had a lot of support, yes, I probably would. George, Tom, someone does have to speak up for Gaza and the Gazans. You know, you, say, you use the word demagogue, uh, you use the word divisive, but surely it is true to say that with 30,000 dead, 100,000 people in total dead or wounded or lost in the rubble, someone is right to speak up for Gaza. And I accept George Galloway can speak up for whoever he likes. He's now an elected member of parliament. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. It comes, for example, not just for the constituents of Rochdale, but in terms of taking part in our national debates, that we don't further tensions, sectarianism, or indeed promote the idea that we should be even electing factions based on religious grounds to parliament. How about that, George? Uh, you, you and I, we, I think we would both concede that the Britain that you and I grew up in has, has radically changed in a very brief space of time. I think it's been more changed and changed more quickly than perhaps any other country possibly ever. Uh, do, you, do you understand, sympathise with the anxieties, the angers, the despair that's there in many communities around the country in the face of change? Uh, that much is uh, undoubtedly true, but I really must deal with this divisive issue. You, you can't sit on the fence on the plausible genocide in Gaza. You're either for it or you're against it. If you're against it, you must speak against it. You must march against it. You must protest about it. And you must call out the people proselytizing for it. Now, if that is divisive, well, what else can one do? Can we try and find a cosy consensus? Maybe we'll kill just people over the age of 45. Maybe we'll only starve uh, those uh, who are already uh, overweight. I mean, what's the consensus, the non-divisive approach to this? Children are being killed. I'm against it. I spoke out against it. The people endorsed my stance. And that's really all there is to it. I have no responsibility to your guest to keep my criticism of a genocide within bounds that please him, even if I were able to divine what those bounds might be. But yes, there's look, there's always been division in politics, Neil. I was active in my first general election at the age of 10 in 1964, when Mr. Wilson savaged uh, the 13th Earl of Hume, 
who was the Conservative Prime Minister at the time, and uh, broke uh, the apparently never-ending rule of the upper-class Conservative patricians. It was a divisive time. The 60s were divisive. The 70s, even more divisive. And they didn't require me in Parliament to be divisive. I've done a, an oral book on the 1970s. Uh, the 70s was the most extraordinary decade in modern times that our country has ever gone through. So, look, politics is divisive. Do you go this way or do you go that way? And let the uh, schools of thought contend and let the people choose between them. That's my view. George Galloway, MP, we will all look forward with a great deal of fascination to see how your latest tenure in Westminster will play out. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Welcome. Next, I'll be joined by Batya Ungar Sargon, the Deputy Opinion Editor of Newsweek and the author of a forthcoming book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. She'll talk about why we have got to where we are and how. Don't go anywhere. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. Join me next is Batya Ungar Sargon, editor, uh, opinion editor of Newsweek. Uh, she has also been the opinion editor of Forward, the largest Jewish media outlet in America. Uh, she has written about how woke media is undermining democracy uh, and also about how the elites have betrayed America's working men and women. 
Bacha joins me now. Good evening. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure and an honour to be here with you. Oh, thank you. Now, you've spoken and written about the abandonment of the working people of the United States of America by the political establishment. Can you develop that thought for us? Yes, absolutely. And I think it echoes with a lot of the themes that you talk about a lot. You know, it used to be that the Democrats in our country represented the working class and the Republicans were the party of the rich and corporations and tax cuts and free trade. And what happened was the Democrats abandoned the working class to cater to what I call the over-credentialed college elites, people who get degrees and work in the knowledge industry. And and unfortunately, the number one thing they pick up at their universities is to have contempt for people who work with their hands for a living, who work in goods and services, who do the kinds of jobs that we all rely on to survive. And so then what you had was one party that represented the rich, which was the Republicans, and one party that represented the elites, the credentialed elites, which was the Democrats. And that's how sort of Trump showed up and was able to really speak directly to the working class, the multiracial working class in this country, and say to them, look, Neither party has a model that's working for you. The Republicans believe in this trickle-down nonsense. The Democrats basically want to cater to the elites and then have large tax ta taxes to uh, fund a welfare state from the bottom to sustain the poor. But neither of those models is what the working class wants, which is what they want is an economy that rewards their hard work because they work really hard and no one was really offering that. Do the Democrats, do they even understand why Donald Trump appeals? Has that penetrated yet, why his message is so effective for his audience? It hasn't. And what we're seeing right now is an absolute reprisal of the kind of language we heard in 2016 when Donald Trump started to rise. And you had Hillary Clinton talking about this basket of deplorables, which was how she called the working class that was flocking to Donald Trump. Now you have this new book, White Rural Rage. They have invented this idea that the working class is racist and xenophobic in order to absolve themselves of the responsibility for having abandoned these people. And they say that they are racist because they want a national border and a trade uh, agreement that protects their labor. This is now called racist by the elites, who, of course, are never threatened by trade, are never threatened by immigrants because they work in the knowledge industry. You need a command of the language in order to do that. You can't be threatened by somebody who doesn't speak English. Whereas when you're working class, those people are coming and they are competing in your industry. And we've seen how it has driven down working class wages. If they are going to treat, if the Democrats are going to treat working people with contempt, to cast them aside into a basket of deplorables, what on earth do they think the consequences of that will be? What does it mean for democracy if the Democrat Party doesn't f seem to feel as though it needs the people? Isn't that ironic? You know, and they took it one step further. They literally tried to get Donald Trump off the ballot in multiple states. Can you imagine this? The side that calls itself the defenders of democracy literally trying to get the most popular politician in the country off of the ballot. There's just so much projection going on. And unfortunately, like we said, in these elite universities, they really imbue the students with this feeling that if you don't have that credential, if you don't have that education, they don't really learn very much, you really don't deserve the franchise. They really believe that, that somehow, if you don't agree with them on their chosen policies, you're not just wrong, but you are evil and a threat and dangerous, and you must be silenced and stopped. But it sounds as though the Republicans also are at least partly inhabiting that same dysfunctional bubble. That that, that, that political class seems to have divorced itself from the people almost in their entirety. How do they function as meaningful parties of people? 
it, you're exactly right. Um, what looks like a political divide in America is actually a class divide separating out the elites in politics, like you said, the elites in the media on both sides from the people. And the thing I try to explain to liberals, because they really don't understand it, is that the working class that votes for Trump there's one thing they hate more in America than the Democrats, and it's the Republican Party. These are conservatives, and they hate the Republican Party because they feel that the Republican Party has sort of pimped them out and sold them out because they agree with them on social issues more than they agree with the Democrats. And so the Republicans say, OK, you know what? We can sell out your future on an economic platform because you'll never vote for the Democrats. So we have you hostage. And they really hate that. Tom Buick, this sounds so familiar on our side of the Atlantic, doesn't it? That, that way in which the political class, if they are a class, uh, have almost consciously cut themselves away from the people they're supposed to represent. You know, just do as I say and not as I do. Absolutely, because when you look at the legislatures on both sides of the pond, they're both the credentialised class, and they've obviously come up on a tide of mass higher education on both sides of the uh, the Atlantic. That in itself is not necessarily the issue. I mean, what I find refreshing actually about our guest here is she's talking about how social class is still one of the most biggest divides that holds people back in our society. So I think both parties, particularly the Democratic Party in the US, needs to start attaching itself again back to that narrative in order to win over these voters that have gone over to Trump. Batia, what do you see lying ahead? You know, if, if, if democracy in the United States, as indeed here in the UK, is in such a parlous state, what, when you look in the crystal ball, do you see unfolding in the months ahead? Well, of course, with a presidential election at the end of the year. Well, I actually feel really happy about the state of our democracy, because if you think about it, uh, you know, in the GOP primary, in the Republican primary, Donald Trump was outspent two to one um, by every single one of his opponents, and he still managed to win. So the electorate, by sheer force of showing up, was able to beat him. And then you look at what he's had to face from the Democratic side, the lawfare, the smears, the impeachments, and he's still managing to outperform Joe Biden in the polls. So I feel really good about the state of our democracy because it does seem to me like the electorate is having its say, despite the Billions and billions of dollars and institutional power that's been thrown at silencing them. The electorate having their say. What a rebellious thought. Bacha <laughs> Ungar Sargon, thank you for joining us this evening. I'll hope thank we can so pick much. up this conversation thank again you. in the future. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News, and that is it for the hour on TV. So stay tuned for Free Speech Nation. But if you're watching online, stay tuned for our second hour, featuring more from George Galloway MP, plus Seb Gorka and Colonel Douglas McGregor. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. We're looking ahead to the new working week. It's going to remain fairly changeable across the country, but increasingly mild. So as we end the weekend, we've still got this area of low pressure in charge. It will gradually move towards the continent as we go through into Monday. But before we get there, we've still got this area of rain stretched right across the country. It will weaken as we go through the course of the night, and really it's going to leave behind quite a lot of mist, murk and cloudy weather. But under the cloud, it's not going to be a cold night by any means. Most of us stay in frost-free, coldest of the temperatures up across the very far north of Scotland. So for many, it's a bit of a grey, murky start out there on Monday morning. Some bits and pieces of light rain and drizzle around. And then during the course of the day, we will see a little bit more persistent rain just coming in across the very far west of Scotland and parts of Northern Ireland. Brightest of the weather will be down towards the southwest. So here in any brightness, we will see highs reaching around 11 or 12 degrees elsewhere. Temperatures a little bit up on Sunday, so feeling a little bit less cold. 
Into Tuesday, another band of rain works its way in from the southwest. The driest and the brightest weather reserved for the far north of Scotland throughout the day. Elsewhere, increasingly cloudy and wet as the day goes on. But it will drag in some milder air. So for everyone in the south, by the middle of the week, we'll see temperatures reaching the mid-teens, but staying wet in the north. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 45 pounds in tax-free cash text gb win to 84902 text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb03 po box 8690 derby de1 nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on friday the 29th of march full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck I'm Martin Daubney, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.